Well, hello, and welcome to the On It, Not In It interview series podcast. I'm your host, Todd Everett, and today I'm joined by Angelo Ramora, who is the co-founder and CEO of Oz Realty. Angelo, thank you so much for joining us. Would you like to kick us off with a brief background as to who you are and what you do? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me, mate. Well, look, I've lost all of my hair. I'm not sure if your audience can see this, but um, I've lost all of my hair in business over the last 10 years. Um, no, mate, look, so I, I moved to the US, God bless America. It's the best country in the world. Um, I truly believe that every time I, I come back here, I, I kiss the floor. And anyone anyone else that thinks otherwise, I say, just leave. You'll be back three months later kissing the floor like I do. Um, <laughs> but look, mate, it moved here from Australia to follow my dream, which was um, uh, to invest in real estate. And um, bought one property without going into too much detail, bought one property, flipped it, made a huge profit. And I was like, bloody hell, this is better than sliced bread. You know what I mean? And one thing led to another, mate, um, eventually uh, settled in Ohio out of all of the places because the beautiful weather and all of the beaches. I love surfing, right? <laughs> no, that's a joke, of course. And started a business there um, where we buy distressed properties, renovate them, get them tenanted through our in-house property management company, and then sell these properties as turnkey cash flowing investments to investors from all over the world. Um, set up an in-house property management company too. Mate, and um, look, I stopped counting at a thousand flips. I've literally bought, renovated and sold over a thousand properties. Again, I don't count anymore. Uh, I've invested in tech, lost my ass investing in a technology product. Um, you know what Warren Buffett says, stick to what you know, right? Well, I definitely didn't follow those principles, so it wasn't good. Look, I've invested in a lot of stocks, made a lot of money during COVID, I'm heavily invested in the stock market right now. I've bought crypto, lost money in crypto, made money in crypto. So at the end of the day, Todd, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to say that I've made more money than I've lost. But, you know, as an entrepreneur, um, you know, you're always going to lose. And I, I don't think that people should um, give up when they lose. I know it sounds a little bit cliche, um, but it just comes down to, you know, uh, learning from the mistakes, learning from the experience and, and just pushing forward. And eventually, eventually, you will lose all of your hair like I did, <laughs> but you will get to where you want to be. <laughs> all right. Well, what a great kickoff. I appreciate you sharing all of that background. So what I would call you in my brain would be almost like a serial entrepreneur. You're not satisfied with one type of risk-taking business startup. You got several going on, right? That's great. So, yeah, well, look, yes. yeah, real estate is my bread and butter. You know, I always fall back on real estate. I always go back to real estate. That's the pillar. That's the anchor per se. That's where I know I can't go wrong. Um, at the end of the day, you know, price is what you pay, value is what you get. As an entrepreneur and as a business owner, um, once you start to learn the ins and outs of profit and loss statements, balance sheets, you can find value in almost anything. And then you got to trust your gut instinct. Sometimes it's wrong, sometimes it's right. So, you know, I can value companies. I mean, you know, for example, I'm, which is quite risky, I'm heavily invested in regional banks right now just because I believe that small business owners like myself are solely dependent on them because of the service that they provide and the terms that they give us. So I think the whole commercial uh, loan fiasco right now and the high interest rates is overblown when it comes to regional banks, but let's not go into too much detail there. Ultimately, mate, you know, I believe that as an entrepreneur and as a business owner, you can find value in anything. Right. Um, and there's not always an opportunity there to make money. Granted, sometimes you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, so great, great, great again, feedback. So let, let me go back to what you started with, which was I came to the US, I bought my first property. So yeah. I want to go back to why. What inspired you to buy that first property? I and mean, you could have got the job in the US, you could have uh, you could have stayed in Australia, but you came to the US and you bought a piece of property. Why would you do that? Yeah, mate, great question. Look, so I quit school when I was 14. Okay, so no, no formal education whatsoever. Um, my staff laughs at me when I type, it looks like you're at a, at a tapanyaki um, uh, joint. You know, the tapanyaki chef is throwing sushi at you. You know, I'm a two-finger pecker, mate. It's a, it's a joke. Um, I got a job as a laborer. So I was working in construction in Australia. And it was hard yakka, as we like to joke around and say in Australia. Uh, but, you know, I always believed that there was something bigger and better out there for me. And my mind started going in a direction of how can I make money work for me instead of me working for it? Started immersing myself in everything and anything business related. Believe it or not, you've got a high school dropout that all of a sudden starts reading books on business, finance, entrepreneurship. Don't ask me how, don't ask me why. Completely became obsessed with the topic of making money, investing, um, passive income, cash flow. Again, making that money work for you and you start, instead of you working for it. And what do you do, mate? I'm in construction. So kind of two plus two equals four, or, you know, in my simple brain, three. But still, you know what I mean? Uh, I was in construction. I understood the, the, the basic flow of how to renovate a house. 
I initially started buying properties in Australia. Um, that market is very, very expensive over there, just like the East Coast and West Coast in, in the US are. And I quickly realized, hey, getting into a ton of debt, losing money every month on the mortgage repayments because the rents don't cover the expenses is not what, what I, well, I, well, I initially started this. This was 2011, 2012. As most of your listeners probably know, the US market was on its knees from, a, from an economical standpoint, especially from a real estate standpoint. The Australian dollar was one for one with the American, which was once in a hundred years. That doesn't happen because the Aussie dollar is always 30 to 40% off the American. And then I started seeing these US prices and, and these cash flows and these rents. And I was like, man, I have to do it. Like this truly is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Again, as corny, as cliche as it sounds, Todd packed my bags and I was here. <laughs> I had to be a part of it, mate. And again, bought that one property, uh, renovated it, sold it, made, I think, like a 20 grand profit. And I was like, damn, this is great. And uh, one thing led to another, mate, started a business. And, you know, you initially start off small and you think, okay, I'm just going to buy 10 hold them and move back to Australia because, you know, I love Australia. Um, but then one thing leads to another. You start a business, you need an assistant. Now, you know, you create, an, you create a monster with 17 different heads. Now you need an acquisitions department, sales department, marketing, finance, legals, human resources. My God. And again, third time I'm saying it, you lose your head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so that's great. So a lot of entrepreneurs did exactly what you do. They see a challenge or an opportunity in the market. And instead of looking at it and say, well, I can't solve that problem, you see it and say, that's a huge opportunity. I love the couple of data points you shared with us. The U.S. market real estate was down. And for the once in 100 years, my dollar was equal in the U.S. as it was in Australia, right. which is awesome, right? It's, a, it's the best time to do that. So you did a little bit of, I'll call it currency manipulation, but not really manipulation, uh, and then taking advantage of a, of a down real estate market in um, did, you said you moved to Ohio. Was your first property in Ohio? No, mate. I initially got off the boat in Kansas City. <laughs> Kansas City. Yeah, that's uh, no boats landed. No boats, I know, right? <laughs> I got off the boat there as a joke around, and then one thing led to another, and I moved to Ohio just because I was mesmerized with the with the numbers I was seeing in that market. It, it looked more attractive to me than the than the Kansas market. Yeah, and Angela, that it's interesting that you'd say that. I mean, I would say that a lot of people come to Ohio to do business because it's an attractive business state, right? Uh, it's a good place to live. It's yeah, you know, we don't have, we can't snow ski, we can't surf, we can't scuba dive. Yeah, we can do all those things. We just can't do it in our own state, right? Yeah. No, well, as you say, Todd, look, cost of living is great, and, and you know, I'm I'm based in um I'm based in Texas right now, and and I love it here. Us Aussies, we get along with the Texans, but I'm back in the office, you know, once a month. Love the people. It's a different vibe. I thought the Texans were going to be more more friendlier here. But the, granted, I'm staying in a posh, snobby area up down. So people are kind of a little bit more, you know, they don't really want to say good day. When I go back to Ohio, everyone's friendly. Everyone's saying good day. Again, cost of living is great, especially from a real estate investment standpoint. Very landlord friendly. So there's no bullshit when it comes to um, dealing with tenants and whatnot. Firm but fair, right? Which, again, is very good for real estate um, yeah, look, again, I, a lot of folks talk down on Ohio. They don't like Ohio. Um, for me, I, I love it, mate. You know, I granted I was based in Toledo for a very long time. I've done my time in Toledo. So maybe out of all of the places in Ohio, don't go to Toledo. <laughs> uh, but again, mate, you know, I, I can't, the, the, the market, especially Toledo has been good to me. It's been good to our investors. It's been good to our company and, um, I'll cherish that forever, mate, for sure. Yeah, so you've told us a little bit about already some of your journey over the last 10 years, adding this person, adding that team, 17 people, acquisitions, department, HR, all the difficulties. So when you started, you probably had some beliefs that were going to happen. So what are some common misconceptions about running a business and how have you addressed them? Oh, wow, mate. Great question. Let me think about that. Beliefs, misconceptions. Look, I'm a very trusting guy um, and I commit to people too easily. You know what I mean? And I think, unfortunately, unfortunately, I have to say that's a big problem because not a lot of people are going to believe in the bigger picture and vision as much as you do. No one's ever going to work as hard as you do or care as much as you do. So you have to be understanding of that. So um, that was, I guess, uh, even to this day, I would say I'm not good at picking the right talent and hiring and retaining them and training them because I'm so passionately involved with the business and I want people to do the best they possibly can, not for me and not for my company, but for themselves. So when I see someone effing around with the blinds for five hours a day, it pisses me off because they're not really stealing from me and cheating me. They're cheating themselves and they're cheating their family. So that's what really frustrates me because again, when I worked as a laborer, Todd, when I was sweeping bloody floors 
in construction boots, gloves, and a helmet, I was bloody dancing like John Travolta sweeping those floors. I was trying to do the best possible job sweeping those floors because, again, I believed one day I'll be working for myself. So the better job I do now and I train my, my mind and soul to execute perfectly or whatever my version of perfection is, sweeping bloody floors on dirty construction sites, I'll be able to replicate that in anything in life. So that's that would be the biggest takeaway that I've had. I've been let down by a lot of people. I, I've lost a fortune uh, and two people trusting the wrong people. Um, so that's something that I think, um, you know, there's a saying business is easy. People make it difficult. And if you can get that aspect, right, which is not easy. I think it's the hardest component. I think you should be good getting everyone to believe in that bigger picture, getting everyone to believe in that vision, the longevity of the company, and then you being political diplomatic, which I'm not, I don't do politics. I don't do diplomacy. I say it as it is. And unfortunately, a lot of people can't hack that. Yeah, no, I appreciate you saying that. There's a couple of things that I would pull out of what you just said. One is no one's going to work as hard as you because you're the business owner and everything depends on what you're doing to for your survival at the end of the day. And to have the expectation that everybody's going to get that and work at that level, really, really almost impossible, right? It, I mean, you want to try to find people to work for you that feel like they're owners, but unless they are, they really don't have that same sense, right? So a couple of things you said that really probably resonates with our listeners. And be more understanding. Be more understanding, yeah. not to expect everyone to perform to your level, you know? Yep. And then because I, I, I can tell you right now, over the last 10 years, you know, I've come full circle. I've probably burnt a lot of good people because of my attitude and my aggressive, I, I think aggressivity or aggressiveness is the right word. Forgive me, mate, again, high school dropout here. So the, the <laughs> lingo is not my strong side, but um. Again, if I wish I could turn back time, but we can't. We live, we learn, we move forward. But that's something that I probably would have done differently. I would have been more patient. And look, mate, for the first five years, Todd, we doubled profits and doubled revenue. I burnt myself into the ground personally. I I, I burnt out times five. Um, I think it's better to grow at 20% per annum for 50 years than 100% per annum for five years and you burn out and you don't want to do it anymore, right? So yep. you know, it's it's a marathon, not a, not a sprint. Slow and steady really does win the race, man. I'm full of these bloody corny sayings today. I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> well, well, let me throw one back at you because you just gave me a really good into it. So uh, you know, spent a couple of years, you're doubling profits year over year, you're doubling revenues year over year because you're burning yourself out. So at some point you realize, man, I got to get some work-life balance, that cliche. Yeah. How do I bring that into it? And what kind of strategies are you using today, Angelo, to, to maintain that work-life balance? Don't believe in it, Mike. I don't believe in it. Um, look, if you're in, your, if you're in, you're in. If you're out, you're out. You know, if you want to make money, you want to grind, you want your business to succeed, you're going to be all in 12, 14, 16 hours a day. Um, what I'm doing differently now, mate, is back in the day, I used to wake up at five, mix Red Bull and coffee, and I would work till late. And I would do that Monday through Sunday, right? Now it's a little bit different. I wake up, I pray. I eat five eggs. I go to the gym. One and a half hour weights. See, I'm huge. Um, one hour, one hour cardio. Come back, meditate, read philosophy. Uh, uh, Jesus calling um, the daily stoic. This, this is something that I'm. Mean, I'm not trying to be evangelistic here, but these are these are books that put me at peace throughout the day. And then I hit the grind, but I'm still grinding, right? I'm still pulling 10, 12 hour days. I'm um, in a different way, in a more healthier way. But the grind is still going to be the grind. Um, I, I, I've always believed that nothing beats hard work. Talent doesn't beat hard work. You know, again, look at me. I always say, if I can do it, anyone can. Um, and all I've known my whole life is to work hard. You know, uh, for example, if I say to him, I'm going to put my head through that wall, I'll put my head through that wall. Eventually I'll break my neck doing it. You know, you're probably smarter than me. You'll just open the door and get to the other side. I'll get to the other side by putting my head through the wall. But again, we still get to the same place, right? Someone does it smarter, better, easier, more efficient. I don't have those skill sets or competencies, so I do it my way. But again, nothing beats hard work. There's a lot of talented people out there with high degrees, much more sophisticated than I am, but they don't achieve the success that I did because they're not willing to put in the effort. Not, they're not willing to work hard. So uh, again, summarizing, mate, I don't believe in that work-life balance. If you're in, you're in. Look after health as much as you can. Um, get to a point where you can be out. Easier said than done. We'll probably need another three episodes for that one. Um, but then when you're out, you're out, mate, you're either exiting the company, you're selling it. Um, I, I don't believe that you can really put it on autopilot. That's just my opinion because the cat leaves, the mice will always play. Um, there are strategies to do that. But then when you're out, mate, you're out, you're going to be sipping pina coladas in the Bahamas or like me, go to Italy, light a cigar and drink cappuccinos with all my Italian folks. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, I love that vision. That sounds like a good one for me too. 
Uh, yeah. But yeah, so I mean, yeah, I get it. I know what you're saying. Like you're in, you got to be in the business. So the work-life balance from my perspective, you just define it differently. Uh, you said that you used to work, you know, Red Bull and coffee to eight o'clock at night. Now you read, you meditate, you work out, you take care of yourself, you eat right. Uh, and yeah. then you you get probably 15 hours of work done in 10 hours because you work more effectively, efficiently. You have some good people around you maybe, maybe eliminating some of the things you used to do. So Correct. I'm not correcting your belief structure, but I just no. want to... No, but see, Todd, still, you know, the thing with me is you're still going to get that call, that gut-wrenching yeah. call, right? Because you're in. It's not like you've cleaned your hands, you've made the exit, and you're not going to get that call anymore. You are in. And from a from a psychological and phys- philosophical standpoint, it hurts. It always hurts us as, an, as an entrepreneurs, getting that call, seeing that email, getting that text. Um, and, you know, the Instagram stuff that we see, that's all BS, if you ask me, mate. I don't, I don't believe in that shit. Because at the end of the day, the most successful entrepreneurs and business owners out there, you don't see them posting on Instagram. They are too busy in the day-to-day to be posting about their life, what they drive and where they go. Now, these influencers, they probably get paid for that. So that is a business in a way for them. Um, but yes, yeah, so I don't, I, you know, don't believe everything you see online. Don't believe everything you see on Instagram. It's a lot of it's for show. A lot of those folks live miserable lives behind the scenes. And in my opinion, in my opinion, they're entrepreneurs, Todd. They're not true entrepreneurs. True entrepreneurs are behind closed doors, grinding stuff out. Yeah, no, I don't disagree with that. I, I understand what you're talking about, Angelo. And, or Angelo, and I'm not trying to like undersell the hard work aspect of running a business. I totally agree with you from that perspective. There's, there's no substitute to get to success to hard work. You can't learn your way there you can't spend your way there you can't hire your way there you got to work your way there love it mike but that's my point i I think you're right in that perspective i will ask one follow-up question so do you take vacations angelo um yes yes i actually i actually went on a walkabout as us ozzy said for a couple of years so i was in europe for a couple of years detoxing from the grind um, and it was very, I think it was very good. It changed me as a, as a person. It really um, put me in a different space of mind and a different place. Um, again, back to the grind now, but I was out for a couple of years per se. Um, mate, it's hard to switch off, Todd, in all honesty. You know, I can probably take a vacation now and go somewhere for two, three, four, five, six, seven days, but your, your, your habitual thoughts are constantly in motion, right? So your mind, you know, the saying, wherever you go, that's where you're going to find yourself. So if I go somewhere, I'm still there. My thoughts are still there. My commitment to the business, our investors, my employees is still there. Um, so again, I, I wish I've figured that aspect out of how to switch off the mind and be more present in specific locations with specific people. Um, but yet, you know, I think that the mind is still thinking, the mind is still creating, the mind is still in another place. So again, mate, if if you figure that out, please share it with me because I'd love to know. <laughs> I'm just digging in because I want our, 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 our listeners to understand your perspective. That's always the mask and follow questions. So. Yeah. So very good. So let me pivot on you just a little bit. So um, you mentioned a couple of different things that were happening as you were starting your business. Obviously, a lot of things have happened over the last 10 years. We have been in a pretty good market, but there was this thing called a pandemic in the middle. Um, so everything's evolving. Business ownership. Uh, I mean, sorry, uh, building ownership, renovation. It's all evolving. So how do you stay relevant how do you stay innovative in your business model yeah mate so look personally i i get a a court or not caught i immerse myself in the in the dna of absolutely everything that's going on from a business perspective standpoint and an economical standpoint especially specific to my niche which is real estate so always monitoring the news what's going on why are certain things happening etc etc so for example a big pivot that we made is I felt a shift in sales. I felt a shift in, in especially now, a lot of people are booked into low interest rates with the 3% mortgage. They've got fixed fixed home loans, so they don't want to sell. They don't want to refinance. A lot of folks that want to borrow can't borrow as much because the interest rates are much higher. So what I'm seeing right now is the market is kind of dead and it has been for, for a while. There's just not much activity. Now, I believe as, as the Fed starts reducing those rates, you're going, to see, you're going to see the floodgates open. We're going to have a lot more activity in the real estate market. But mate, I, again, you know, we made a pivot around two years ago where 70% of our business was focused on sales, meaning buying distressed properties, renovating them mm-hmm. and selling them. A couple of years ago, we completely shifted that with a 70% focus on property management and growing the book of business from a property management standpoint. I hated my life for the first five years with property management, Todd. I, I really did because I think we broke every 
law known to mankind and every rule except one. We never compromise the trust account. And thank God for that because that's jail time. But you make a lot of mistakes. Again, honest mistakes. Um, and then it takes a long time to figure out what you're doing, how you're doing it. I mean, we didn't even know how to use Appfolio, which is the main property management accounting software for rent collection and distribution. So it was an absolute nightmare. You know, fast forward five years, which is around five years ago, we started getting very streamlined, very efficient, got some good people on board, started getting systems in place, started hiring a lot of remote workers, started getting automation with tech. Um, right now, mate, I love the business. It's probably, it's the, it's by far the best business that I've ever seen in my area of competence. Recession proof, people will always need a roof over their head, predictable. I know exactly what income I'm going to be generating. I can see how it scales. I know the value of the company. So again, it's just a beautiful, beautiful business. On the first of the month, the rents are due. We collect the rents, we get our fees, and off we go with the with the day to day management side. We're the best rep. We're the best rated in Toledo by far. So our reputation is pristine. And I never thought I would say this, but I'm getting to a point where I'm actually looking at doing an M and A in town because we're so efficient, we're so streamlined, we're by far the best in town, and it's time for scale. Um, so that's kind of the pivot that we have made. But I guess from an entrepreneurial standpoint, mate, you got to immerse yourself in everything and anything um, economy wise. And you might, there's going to be instances where it might be right in front of you and you won't see it. You won't. You'll be looking at it. You won't see it. You'll be looking at it. You won't see it. But if you keep looking, <laughs> you, will, you will eventually, it will get through your thick, thick brain and you will figure things out and you will see it. So that's when I talk about the DNA of the PL, the balance sheet, the operations, uh, how many opt-ins, the lead flow, how many calls, how many conversions, all of the little little nuts and bolts of the business. If you can keep your finger on the pulse with that, you'll see where you're declining and where there's potential to tweak, to adjust, to pivot, to shift, um, you know, to put gasoline on the fire for something else that's working. That's awesome. That's awesome. So so I think you've been dropping little nuggets along the way, and I'm just going to give you one more chance to hammer, ha hammer your single message home. So what yeah. advice would you offer to an aspiring entrepreneur? who's just getting started, or maybe they're hitting that challenge, that wall that you're going to break your head through, what would you tell them to do? Mate, don't give up. Don't give up. Honestly, just um, there's going to be days where you feel like giving up, but just tell yourself it's another day and wake up the next morning and show up. Yeah, and that's it. And eventually you will figure things out. That's it. That's all I can say. No matter how many times you get knocked over, pick yourself back up, keep moving forward. That's something that I've done. And I advise everyone else to do it. Just do not stop. Do not give up no matter what you will. You know what, Todd? It doesn't matter how many times you're wrong. As long as you're right once and it counts. Yeah. Right. You can start no. businesses, fail miserably at nine of them. But one is a success. You're done. You're, you're, you've yeah. succeeded. Yep. I love it, Angela. In fact, in my house, um, when things, so my cliche, I'll give you one. I, how about I give you a cliche for life? Please do, please do. I'm waiting my, for it. <laughs> my, my cliche is this. Life is not in the falling down. It's the getting back up. 100%. So, well, thank you so much, Angelo, for joining us today. We really appreciated meeting you. It was great having you on our podcast, learning more about your entrepreneurial journey, the message that you had for our great listeners. To everyone watching and listening, we look forward to seeing you and hearing you on our next episode. Thanks again, Angela. Thanks, mate. It's a pleasure.